Uh, my name is Dane Young, as you can see in the bottom left. Um, we have a couple disclaimers that I need to go through. Uh, the first of which, and probably the most important of which, is the fact that in spite of what my attire says, I do not actually work for VMware. Um, I was on a uh, Citrix user group panel yesterday uh, with a couple of my other Citrix CTP colleagues. And um, so my first disclaimer is, while I'm talking about VMware topics, I do not work for VMware. Um, I don't work for any vendor in this space. And so you're going to get um, an unbiased and honest lessons learned. I get a picture of you in VMware shirt. <laughs> <laughs> now, Gabe, on the other hand, actually does work for VMware. <laughs> and VMware is, is in the room. Um, so I will be as, as much of a gentleman as possible. <laughs> Um, so, so for real though, um, I'm a uh, self-employed entrepreneur, owner of a company uh, that you will see on the slides. Um, but I don't work for Citrix, Microsoft, VMware, NVIDIA, Nutanix, you name it. However, I very, very much love technology. Um, I'm a geek at heart. I think a lot of us that ended up in IT have a background in some form of geekery. Um, and that is definitely me. I love technology, I love talking about technology. It kind of borderlines on the side of um, self-promotion at times, and that's not intentional. Um, it's not all about self-promotion, but there's good information that needs to get out there, and the best way to do that is by having as loud of a megaphone as possible. So, uh, I love technology, I don't work for Citrix. I do a fair amount of work through um, other national uh, partners in this space, so, um, the term that the industry uses is bar, uh, you guys are probably all familiar, is either a customer or working for some form of integrator. Um, the lessons learned study that I'm going to be um, giving you today is from work that I've done through a bar uh, that is very well established with this customer and needed my expertise to come and deliver on this solution. Um, similarly, I do not represent that partner. Um, and I don't represent the customer, and so for the sake of protecting those involved, um, names have been obfuscated. Um, but I will do my best to give you the real and honest details about the deployment and how things went. Um, interaction is highly encouraged. Uh, I don't like doing the entire monologue whole thing on the presenting side, so if you see something that sparks your interest and you want to ask a question, feel free to ask it then or save it to the end, either way. Um, I am going to do it UDP style, so I'm going to fire a bunch of content out there and hope that some of the packets have been received, because um, so, I have a lot of content that I want to cover. Um, so we're going to go fast. Uh, the heroes in this story, we've seen a lot this week on storytelling and all that kind of stuff, and the heroes in this story is every single person that's involved in this project. Just because I'm the one that's sharing the lessons learned doesn't mean that I'm the hero. I'm, I'm not. It took a team effort, it took a lot of hard work, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. In fact, a little bit more tears than I would have liked, um, but we got it done. Um, this is not a session about this tech versus that. Uh, it's not a bake-off session. If you're interested in protocol assessments or infrastructure comparisons or anything like that between VMware, Horizon, and other technologies that are on the market, this is not that session. Um, yeah, so a short version is I'm a lover, not a hater and I love technologies, VMware included. A um, little bit of history about me. Uh, some of you might wonder, you know, has he turned 21 yet? Is he drinking age? It's, it's okay, it's okay. I know, I, I, I look young, and my last name is Young, so it just kind of, it goes on, on this whole thing of young. And, um, and a little bit of my background in IT. Uh, I was a, um, an apprentice for somebody that did what I'm now in, my, what is my passion, which is uh, consulting and advisory services. So that was kind of my entry into IT as an apprentice and a sysadmin for him and his staff. Um, and it's an amazing company, and it was my first taste of like going around and talking to different customers, hearing their pain points, solving problems, blah, 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 like all this stuff. And once I got that taste, I was like, I, I gotta somehow find a way in IT to be at a point where I can consult and talk to different customers and hear their pain points and help them on their journey. Um, but I was actually a VMware customer 
before I was a Citrix customer. Just a little point of reference. Um, so the IT shop that I worked at, we had deployed uh, GSX. Some of you may remember that product. Um, I know I look young, but I'm, I've been in IT long enough to remember and deploy GSX. That was um, when you were seven, right? Yes, that's exactly yeah. right. Okay. So that apprentice actually took me on when I was four. Okay. So <laughs> I'm trying to instill the same values in my kids, like start early, start often. Um, so um, when I was a customer, uh, I was a Citrix or a VMware customer before a Citrix customer. Then I worked for an MSP and I started getting exposed to all kinds of projects and implementations and all that fun stuff. So. Um, while I talk about a lot of different technologies, it's because I love a lot of different technologies. Um, the details have been obfuscated. The project team that was involved in this uh, deployment will recognize some of the things that I'm going to go through in content. Um, but if you haven't been involved in this, everything that is sensitive has been um, masked. So um, this is a little bit of my uh, philosophy we saw in the, in the keynote talking about values and that kind of thing. This is a, a, a book that I've prescribed to um, that talks about the ideal team player. Um, humble, hungry, and smart is the three letter or the three word um, association here. So if I sound a little bit egotistical or arrogant, I apologize. It's because I'm passionate and I'm interested and I wanna, I wanna advance the industry for the betterment of everybody. Um, but these are uh, four values that I've prescribed to. Um, so I am from California which is the furthest, Woo! yeah, James Davis. Um, so, well, maybe not the furthest in the United States because Alaska is further. Um, but when you're talking about going west, young man, go west, young man, um, there's this concept of the pioneer. And Webster defines the, the pioneer, not the new Merriam-Webster, blah, 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 that dictionary is garbage. The original 1828 Webster defines it as one that goes before to remove obstructions or prepare the way for another. So nobody is at fault, VMware included, customer included, myself included, for any of the challenges that arose and that we overcome as part of this project. This is the heart of pioneering. There's going to be blood in the water. It's what you do with it that matters. So. This customer was a pioneer in their space. <coughs> 30,000 seats for a Horizon deployment is not the biggest, to be honest, it's not. Um, there are larger deployments out there, but um, you'll see some of the complexity that this customer had to go through and some of the reasons why they were a pioneer in this space charging territory that had never been taken before. So I'm gonna give um, a little bit of comedy throughout my presentation. It's not because I'm unprofessional or I don't care about presenting myself in a professional manner. It's just because it's the last day, you guys drank a lot last night, and I just want this to be entertaining. So I'm gonna go do some things that are things to do and things not to do. And hopefully it keeps things lively and entertaining and, and you all get a good uh, value out of that. Um, so things not to do, so anytime you see the green slide, these are things to do. Anytime you see the red slide, these are things not to do. Just kind of follow that approach. So let's go ahead and practice. Um, if you all have your mobile devices, um, you can certainly use them throughout um, the session. If you would like to be like um, Roy up here, who's an IT director. Roy's amazing. I've seen shows about Roy because he's so cool. Um, so you can certainly go on Twitter and get a couple million retweets and likes um, talking about how incredible and amazing, and you might even use the word lit, my session is. So that's things to do. Things not to do would involve going on Urban Dictionary the entire time I'm presenting and looking up words like lit and finding out that it's something that is really good, amazing, crazy, in a good way. Or taking it one step further. Sorry, that's fire. Fire is the first one in Urban Dictionary. And then there's lit. When, when something is turned up or popping, these are kid vernaculars. These are teen vernaculars. I have a privilege of working with many of you. Liddy is an extension of lit, which many of you have probably never heard of before. <laughs> but you've just got an education on Urban Dictionary and, and the vernacular that's being used. So it's, it's an adjective reaching the pinnacle of litness. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> the pinnacle of litness. Once you've reached the pinnacle of litness, you're Liddy. Most especially things not to do, don't troll me, okay? 
I'm putting my head up, which means that I'm a, I'm a target for attacks. I, I deal with that all the time. Please don't go on Twitter and badger me about, oh my god, I can't believe that Dane just said X, Y, and Z about VMware, and it's terrible, and it's trash, and you know, it's, it's actually being recorded, so I'll have proof that I didn't actually say all those terrible things that you're going to troll me about. So, a little bit about me. Uh, I am Young Tech, the extension of my team is Young Tech, and I'm an entrepreneur, strategist, consultant. I am honored um, that will hum humble, hungry, smart. I talk a lot, uh, maybe too much, potentially, um, but because I talk a lot, a lot of vendors have recognized that I'm an influencer and have a following and people want to hear what I have to say about particular topics, so I've been recognized by Citrix, NVIDIA, and VMware um, as one of X uh, number of invite-only participants worldwide in CTP, uh, NGCA, and UC Champion. Um, you may never have heard about my blog, and that's not because I haven't written content that is relevant and meaningful that you might have actually Googled before, but this domain name was a little bit expensive because of the name, and so I only justified it to the CEO of my house, my wife, um, that we needed to buy youngtech.com when I actually had a business to go around youngtech.com because spending that kind of money on a personal blog that doesn't generate revenue is not exactly going to go over very well. So I blogged on different sites. Like uh, a couple years ago, I had a community of, of other bloggers that didn't have their own space, so we contributed to a site called ITVCE, uh, which is an IT virtualization cloud evangelist blog. Um, I had a, uh, another domain, danyoung.com, but this is now where all of my main content is going. You can find all of it on my Twitter feed. Okay, so a little bit about me. You guys want to get into the content, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just start doing the whole UDP, you know, fire and forget type of approach. Um, I have a lot of personal interests, most especially as my wife and four kids. Um, they are the, you know, the reason why I do what I do and sometimes travel too much. Um, is to provide a good life for uh, my kids. Um, I help with youth programs, so this is one of the camping trips that we did where I had the privilege of having eight um, 11 to 14 year old boys in a tent with me for three days. You might think that being a parent is hard. Try parenting and being a leader for other people's young kids. It's quite a challenge. Um, I've done some uh, obstacle course races. I ran a marathon. Um, this was by far the hardest obstacle course race that I ever did. It's called a Spartan Ultra. It's 30 miles in elevation. We climbed 10,000 feet of elevation. We did 70 obstacles over the 30 miles. It was grueling. Um, I'm not doing that again. Uh, uh, I did it twice. That was enough. And here's, it was lit. It was definitely, <laughs> it, was, it was fire in my legs but for Dane, 30 miles. Dane, was yes. it Liddy? It was Liddy, yes. Okay. It, it was the pinnacle of litness. Right, okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> litness, yes. Um, so right now, most cool, well, the coolest personal aspect of my life is a uh, cabin that we have. I live in Northern California, so Tahoe's in my backyard. So uh, we have a family cabin that is this tiny little hole in the wall, but it's our hole in the wall, and it's a space in the middle of beautiful forest, uh, El Dorado National Forest, and I've started doing some um, CrossFit competitions. So, um, in the past, I've done a lot of work with a lot of big name companies that many of which you probably you know heard of, recognize their name, so on and so forth. Um, healthcare, um, financial services, you name it. I've been in consulting for quite some time. Um, Fifteen months ago, I started Young Tech as a standalone company, but I've been doing consulting and services for some time. Um, Lots of big customers, lots of recognizable um, deployments, 30,000 seats for Verizon isn't the largest deployment that I designed and deployed, but it's certainly a uh, challenging one nevertheless. All identities have been obfuscated, because Patrick Coble's in the room and he will absolutely hack into all of their personal lives. So um, they've been obfuscated or obscured to protect the innocent. Um, so let's talk about Sacred Heart. Sacred Heart is the name of the organization that I'm going to use throughout my presentation. Some of you may recognize this is actually from a show called Scrubs, which is hilarious. Uh, really good show. Um, I need to reference my notes because this is whole, uh, just a whole bunch of numbers. And you're like, what, is, what do those numbers mean? 
So the numbers are 29 hospital locations, 19 acute care hospital locations, five short stay hospitals, two behavioral health hospitals, two rehabilitation hospitals, one transitional care hospital, 20 outpatient facilities, 250 other community access points, uh, 3,900 licensed beds. That's a big environment for healthcare. It's not the largest, but it's decent size. 30,000 is the number of users. 30,000 is also the number of laptops and desktops under management. 11,000 is the number of clinical workstations, and this is important because we'll get into why later, because the clinical environment is very different than a common in IT environment. Um, they uh, have 14,000 concurrent sessions for published apps or RDSH, um, 11 or uh, 1,000 VDI sessions. Uh, that number is increasingly growing. Two data centers that are active active. Anybody recognize who this is? Simon Sinek. Start with why. Um, before you go on any journey, you need to figure out what the destination is and why would you want to go on that journey. Um, for them, it was all around availability, <coughs> security, productivity, and efficiency. Sounds nice. Let's deep dive into what that actually means. A whole bunch of justification for this project. Before they could go to the board and get funding and everything else, they had to say, why are we doing this? And this was an exercise that I took them through that they got a lot of value out of, um, even up to the CIO. It's like, yeah, we don't always take the time at the beginning of the project to go through this process, but when you start to hit road bumps and obstacles along the way, it's good to go back and reference this to say, guys, I know it's hard, I know it's painful, I know there's a lot of blood in the water, but it's gonna work out. Um, uh, you're going to see a little bit of nomenclature for PowerShell throughout here. I apologize. It's because I'm a geek at heart. I like, I like PowerShell. I like VBScript before it. But, you know, get client snapshot, uh, little PowerShell reference there. What did they look like when the project started? Um, well, they already had two access URLs. Um, I'm going to use these terms kind of generically, um, VIDM at the time. So VMware Identity Manager. I'm not going to spend a bunch of time going into click, clicking into each individual product. If you want to learn more about the products, take a deep dive on that product. We're going to go high level. We're going to go fast. Um, so they had different URLs. They had existing uh, Horizon um, connection servers. There were 751 in a CloudPod architecture, or CPA. You're going to see that acronym a lot. Um, they were upgrading them to 770 uh, as part of this project. Uh, they were active active with two data centers, four Horizon pods, two and two, two in each data center. Um, good stuff. Um, less than 250 concurrent sessions in Horizon at the beginning of this project, um, predominantly thin clients. So they were already a VMware customer before we started this journey, but they went fast, which is fine. Um, load balancers throughout, they're an F5 shop, so they're using F5 load balancers. They have gateways and proxies, different things to, um, to get connected in the environment. Um, this is an interesting point. Um, instant clone only. If you've done the Uni Horizon work, you know that there's three different image delivery uh, mechan mechanisms or technologies. One is full clones, the other is link clones, the other is instant clone. Instant clone being the latest and greatest and newest and challenging. I'll get into that later. Um, blast only. This is actually a good thing. So um, they <coughs> had already done their evaluations, had already looked into PC over IP, RDP, and blast and decided because of everything that they were um, being fed and the information that they were getting, that they needed to put their chips on the bedding table for blast. These are good things to do. So a couple good things was the fact that it was already established, it was already a, already a technology that they were using, their instant clones, this is good. You don't want several different management technologies if you can avoid it. Um, blast only, also good. I've run into customer deployments where they're trying to support a multi-protocol environment and they're running into nuances um, between the different protocols within Horizon. So try and simplify where you can because as you'll see as we go through this, it's going to be complex enough as it is. So try and simplify the things that you can. All right, project start. Um, this is what the existing environment for a corporate <coughs> technology that they were utilizing uh, looked like at the beginning of the project. Um, they had six access URLs, um, three unique environments, distinct environments that they were managing for uh, the previous environment. They were active active in two data centers, like I mentioned. And what I mean active active, they actually do intentionally load between both data centers. Um, 
They're an epic shop, so their cache is in one data center, but they have low enough latency that the end users do not notice any differences from a performance uh, perspective when you're going across uh, the metro link between the two data centers. Um, they're five to ten percent remote, which is also a good thing to note. For the future, we'll come back to that. Um, Fifteen percent were external partner, um, unmanaged. So, if any of you are Epic customers, you're probably familiar with Community Connect. It's a very common program with Epic. Um, they were absolutely um, in that uh, mindset of leveraging the infrastructure that they have for Epic and allowing other partners to consume it. Um, but the challenge there is um, these are unmanaged devices from the uh, TV organization standpoint because they don't have SCM and agents and all those things on these external partners' devices that are in there. Um, they had load balancers, they had gateways and proxies, they had over 700 session hosts. Um, so good size environment, not small potatoes. Um, 550 RDS were 2008 R2, I'll come back to that later. Um, 350 apps. 14,000 concurrent users. CCU is a concurrent user acronym, so anytime you see that, that's concurrency. Um, so this was a decent size environment um, at the project start. Uh, mixed image management, they had different technologies for delivering the imaging to this RDS environment. Um, Git resources. Uh, let's talk about this. If you're gonna go on a journey, you better figure out what tools are available in your tool bag to your, in your tool bag to help you on that journey. Um, there's a ton of them. I'm not going to go through all of them because as you can see down here, if you aggregate them, it's 895 pages of documentation, which is a lot to consume. I've been doing this a while, so over the years I've consumed this, but if you're just starting or if you're trying to accelerate your deployment, this is a lot of content to digest and consume. So how do we eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? Um, the best methodology uh, that I have for designing and deploying a large environment is to break it up into bite-sized pieces that are easily consumable and that naturally feed into each other. Um, so some of you, if you've worked with other vendors, may be familiar with some of the terminology that I'm using here. I like to cut up a design into layers, user layer, access layer, resource <coughs> control, so on and so forth. That allows you to take information from one layer and move it into the next, and move it into the next, and move it into the next, and you'll have design decisions that you use along the way. Waterfall methodology. Generally speaking, you have a um, phase. At the end of the phase, it moves to the next phase. At the end of the phase, it moves to the next phase. And here's an example of the phases. Your scale for X is going to be dependent on the tonnage of your elephant. So how big of an elephant are you going to eat? Well, that's how long the project is going to take when you're following a waterfall methodology. So let's talk about the customer's timeline. Milestone one, SOW signed, ready to go. Two assessments, we're in the first SOW. Let's assess the existing environment. Let's assess the end state or the um, existing environment for both, uh, what they're moving from and their horizon infrastructure and create documents. Um, we got the first assessment delivered around February timeframe last year, March, the second assessment was delivered. This were, these were about 30 page um, paperweights. I mean, you guys have been doing this for a long time. So there's a lot of content that goes into this for the sake of thoroughness to make sure that we evaluated all of the aspects that are involved and nothing was overlooked. So, um, you know, good sized documents. The hardware that was already sized and ordered for the new environment even before January. So that's an important thing to note because depending on the size of infrastructure, you got lead times and manufacturing data centers and all these people that need to be coordinated and facilitated with while you're working towards your project. Um, so the assessments were delivered. They had a deadline to have an expected go live in May. Um, that was because their EHR upgrade was happening in June. So they're an epic shop, like I mentioned. So they were going through uh, a major release. Um, and right in between here was an important deadline that kind of predicated the first expected go live date, which was the $2 million savings on their migration. So that's an important thing to note. A lot of CIO, a lot of board influence saying this is the project, this is when we need all this stuff done. 
Um, so somewhere in here, March to May, we needed to slide in this milestone X, Y, and Z, which was to design, implement, <laughs> test, and scale. Because um, the assessment is done, and if you're following a waterfall methodology, you assess first, and you design, you deploy, then you test it, and then you manage it, and you scale it, and all that fun stuff. Um, insufficient system resources exist. Anybody seen this error? Things not to do. <coughs> Remember, we're going to come back to this. Things not to do. You don't want to do this. You, you really, really don't want to do this. Um, if, you, if you remember the Solitaire game, I know, again, I'm too young to remember Solitaire on Windows 3.1, but this might happen if you have insufficient resources. Um, things to do. There's this thing called an Agile methodology. Um, it doesn't follow waterfall, and it involves a much more iterative approach. The assessments were delivered, but the CIO's timeline didn't change, in, in spite of the fact that the assessment said, this is going to be a lot of work from March to May. It's like, yeah, it's a lot of work. Let's get to it. Like, we got stuff to do. So the customer um, implemented a very <coughs> effective methodology around um, Agile with the Scrum Master and with team members that were all contributing towards sprints. Yes? couple interesting points. This is somewhat unusual, but I just want to make sure I understand. That. You did say RDSH and 340 something apps earlier. Yeah. So those apps are already running on RDSH. Sure. So the testing cycle is minimized because of that. Because that yes. alone would take up. Yes, the, te the testing cycle largely involved um, broker changes, protocol changes. Um, we'll get into some of the, the challenges right. um, with the different technologies. Yeah. Um, but the testing cycle was not. We need to make sure that this app works on an RDSH <coughs> platform. It's we need to make sure it works on the Verizon RDSH exactly. platform. That's a big deal. It is a big and deal the other one on that timeline. You blew through this, but I think you said they actually ordered the infrastructure and hardware before the assessment. Yeah, prior prior to the end of the previous year. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So it was sized. It was ordered. There was there was a buffer to order more as more was needed. But this was part of a large tech refresh that they had already yeah. forecasted and budgeted. And they knew that they were going to get off the 2008 R2 platform, off the existing hypervisor infrastructure that they were on. So they knew they had to buy a new kit in one way or another. Out, out of curiosity, just as a fine point, did they um, extrapolate for the increased resource utilization in 2016? Um, yes. Okay. So they were not they as not that. as much as should have been, right. but they did. Right. Okay. Yeah. And and again, those that have worked with Epic know. Um, being an honor roll, having good standing with Epic, is largely based on your RTTs and your exception percentages. Mm -hmm. And so if those numbers go too far out of skew, you're going to run into a lot of trouble. Um, and interesting, if, um, if you don't have a lot of other good UX measures, um, system pulse and other things, um, that's the one number that everybody zeroes in on. Our environment's slow. Why is it slow? Our exception percentages are higher than they should be. Have users called the complaint? No. Again, these are things that you run into um, in healthcare environments. So we had a lot of work to do in, a, in not a lot of time. Um, the risks and recommendations from the assessment, I'm not going to go through each of these uh, just for the sake of time. But those two documents that w were delivered included things that they needed to be uh, mindful of as we we're moving to the next stage, including user segmentation, getting better profiles on how the users were broken up in the organization, testing and fast user switching. So if you know about Improvata and you know about badge access, you know you can tap in, tap up, tap out. Um, quick uh, reconnect times between those um, devices is really important. Um, definitive list of devices and peripherals. In a large healthcare environment, this is a big, big deal. If you're gonna switch out the protocol, you're gonna switch out the broker, you're gonna switch out anything that touches or interfaces with devices and peripherals, watch out. Um, access me uh, methods and branding review. So how many portals, how many URLs, how many access points were they going to support when it came to not just their internal environment, but external and partner access. Um, OS replatforming requirements. So they decided in s that this timeline wasn't aggressive enough as it was, that they were also going to go through an OS migration at the same time. So they went from 2008 R2 and said, we don't want to wait until January 2020. We want to do it now. So they went through the testing process to re-platform to a new modern operating system for their predominant um, RDS environment at the same time. Policy and pers uh, personalization review. So this is all around user environment management, all those fun things. Um, additional service desk training. The, the training, the service desk wasn't really tooled 
to be able to support the new environment. They were pretty familiar with the existing environment, but the new one was going to be a big change. Um, additional UAGs, so when the project started, there were a couple single points of failure for those 5 to 10% remote access users. If you're going to go scale, you need to make sure that you have every single point of failure possible that could affect patient access, could affect your environment, and you got to get those addressed. Um, phase out and retire the existing uh, APM access method. If any of you have deployed Horizon, you know there's two primary mechanisms for getting remote access. One is using an F5 um, product called APM. The other more common and more accepted method is to use VMware's product called UAG. Um, UAG is just a web service that sits on appliance, that sits in the DMZ. It's easy to scale, it's easy to load balance, it's easy to manage, not so much for APM. Most customers are moving away from APM in favor of UAG. So um, they still have legacy APM, that, and it was a re recommendation to get rid of it. Resource segregation and isolation. I'm gonna go a little bit faster than I'm going right now. Um, so yeah, there are a couple more assessment recommendations here. Um, they had a, a Horizon client issue that was plaguing them where it would actually take two minutes to enumerate and launch applications when it was going through a GTM or a global load balancer. But if they hit the VIP directly in the LTM, it was fast, it was easy, everything was working. So there was some kind of bug that either their configuration or the client um, was presenting. Um, and additional connection servers were required because they were going from a much smaller environment to a much larger environment. CPA uh, segregation for Epic, lots of stuff. So. During the migration, this is what things look like. Um, they had UAGs, they had Horizon connection servers in pods. They did the right thing, which is segregating RDS from VDI workloads. If you're large enough, it's a no-brainer. Um, you don't want your RDS and your VDI workloads in the same local pod. That's why CloudFire architecture exists, to stitch these things together. And then because they were active-active across the data centers, everything that you see in one data center was also mirrored and available in the other data center for UAGs and DMZ components and everything else. Um, deployment challenges. Again, no fault or blame is being in, implied by any of these conversations. These are just things that we were working through and we got resolved um, and things are, are going quite well now. Um, they ran into a situation where an RDS server in a pool would become unresponsive and cause load balancing on the other RDS servers to get out of whack, to become imbalanced. And that was affecting patient access because servers are getting overloaded, they have more sessions on them than they were designed to scale, and it created quite a bit of an issue. Um, this one was horrific. Um, again, there was blood in the water, a couple of tears cried. Um, I got to know the client very intimately because we spent close to 40 hours over a three-day weekend together fighting with this bug. Um, it was not um, it was not something that anybody was aware of, um, but there's a MVFBC enable, um, fast fast buffer capture. Uh, it's an NV NVIDIA component that if you drop the NVIDIA drivers on an RDS server, it's gonna make a call to an executable that it's expecting for a VDI scenario, that if that executable doesn't perform what it needs to correctly, it can actually, in this case, contribute to the first scenario which is RDS server becoming unresponsive. Um, the fix was <coughs> terrific. Um, and unfortunately, um, NVIDIA got a lot of blame for this, even though it was a VMware product code issue. Um, NVIDIA ended up getting a lot of the fingers pointed at them because they tested both in, in scenarios with the GPU, without a GPU, and they're like, yeah, we're just fine without a GPU, so we're ripping the GPUs out of all of these RDS VMs. And that's basically the end goal when the reality is just a couple of file renames can actually fix the bug in the current version of the product that they're on, while NVIDIA and VMware so are you're resolved. saying the customer did pull the GPUs? They that, did. That has the For RDSH right. in Epic. Okay. So their Epic environment doesn't have GPU acceleration because of this um, patient impacting event. Okay. Um, connection okay. servers become overloaded. Okay. Yes? Quick, uh, same question. Is that not Epic certified then? Or what happened? How did they get that config? Which config? The the GPU. The, uh, the version, all the things that are supposed to be uh, Epic certified. Yeah, Epic didn't <coughs> certify for the okay. GPUs. Um, or, you know, versions of the products, interoperability, and all that kind of stuff. Um, VRealize for Horizon bug, there's a memory leak in a version of VROPS um, 
B rocks or horizon that they encountered. Um, load not properly balanced between pods or global entitlements, because things were getting uh, improperly loaded. <coughs> Instant clone provisioning becomes frozen. Clients become randomly disconnected. This was a uh, F5 persistent heartbeat <coughs> setting. There's an article that talks about how that should be configured. <coughs> and then the RDS VMs were unbalanced be behind the global entitlement, so they were improperly waiting to certain pools instead of others, which was causing that infrastructure kit to become overloaded and create performance degradation. So things not to do. Um, get literal meaning. Um, there's a couple documents out there that talk about sizing Horizon connection servers for your environment. And if you're going from 250 sessions to 15,000 sessions, these are things that you might want to consider. But don't take the numbers literally. Please, I beg you, I implore you, don't take these numbers literally. If it says 4,000 sessions and 2,000 are recommended, make sure that you dig a little bit deeper into the underlying meaning behind these numbers um, because it's going to bite you or has the opportunity to bite you. It bit me. I've been doing Horizon for a long time. This particular nuance bit me and it didn't feel nice. Um, so with um, active sessions per connection server, it's largely dependent on a technology that almost every Horizon deployment that I've worked with utilizes because if you have HTML access as a potential access method, there is this thing. Um, oh, oh yeah, there's an architecture planning document as well. So there's the KB, but there's also the architecture planning document. Both talk about this 4,000, 2,000 number. I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, there it is again. So if you have this thing called BSG, you're going to have these default configurations and tested configurations applied to your BSG enabled Verizon connection server. BSG is actually very common. Um, if you have an HTML access scenario and you don't connect using the legacy client, you go through a browser and then you click on a resource and it opens a tab, you might have seen that lovely cert error if you don't have certs properly signed, um, certificate authority certs installed on every single RDSH agent, every single DDI, you might get a cert error. So most customers utilize this switch that I'll talk about in just a little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, architecture planning document, it says specifically to get to the 4,000, you have to set this config flag for max connections equals 4,000. Um, this is the special con consideration that I'm talking about. If you go in here on your connection server and you say edit it and you go to this section that talks about HTTPS secure tunnel, PC over IP secure gateway, blast secure gateway, and so on, um, if you do this flag right here that says use Blast Secure Gateway for HTML access to this machine, the beautiful thing is you don't have to install certs on every single RDS agent and every single VDI desktop because it's going to tunnel those through the connection servers and life's going to be beautiful. However, you have to set this property here to get your max connections to 4000, which is a tested configuration. Um, there's a locked properties file. There's a couple things that you can set in here. Um, including if you're going to go in here, just do this one because it's going to save your butt later. You can read the article on why to do that one. Uh, check for and false. It's, it's a very nice um, configuration. Don't make assumptions. Don't be like me. Um, the document doesn't actually differentiate between what are called protocol sessions and what are called broker connections. And this was through a conversation with the developer that I discovered that there is a nuanced difference and that both the KB article and the sizing guide need to be rewritten to properly define what it means when you're talking about 4,000 versus 2,000. Because if you take it literally, you're like, oh yeah, 2,000, I'm good. Oh yeah, 4,000, I'm good. I got enough connection servers. Um, and if you're in any large environment, you're probably going to have a fair number more devices than you have concurrency in your environment. It's just the reality of the way that things work. A lot of um, employees or contractors have two or three devices. If you have 30,000 clients, but only 15,000 concurrent users for years, I made the error. And again, this is a lesson learned. I'm being humble here. I made the error of sizing based on the concurrency for years. Never bit me once. I would deploy the number of Horizon connection servers in pods to scale, whether I'm doing 2,000 or 4,000 to meet this number. However, if you drop a Horizon client and you set certain parameters that say 
fire up the client on startup, fire up the client on login, authenticate to this connection server, pull me a list of resources. You need a size for the number of clients that you have, not the number of concurrent sessions that you have. Because every single one of those clients is gonna fire off a session to the connection server as, back to that thing that I talked about, a brokered connection where the client goes all the way through the connection server and establishes and enumerates the resources. Very different than protocol sessions. So keep that in mind, size for the number of devices that you have, especially if you're doing creative things like auto login of the client, auto pulling of resources. Improvata tap and go has an interesting effect on um, broker connections um, because in certain scenarios you can actually have a two for one where it will establish multiple broker connections to get those resources off the connection servers for each tap and go experience. And, and then there's a local login as well. So these are nuanced things that you have to take into consideration. Instant clones, if you've worked with the technology, you've probably read this article. It's a very nice article, it was written in 2016 when the tech was first launched. It's called The Anatomy of the Instant Clone. And it talks about the fact that with instant clones, you have a master image, you have a template, and then the, from the template is gonna be a replica, and then from the replica is gonna be all these CP parents. Uh, so there's the replica right there, there's the CP parents. And you're gonna have one on every data center on every host. So keep that in mind if you're gonna size for a fairly large environment um, that you're gonna have a lot of these. You're gonna have a lot and a lot and a lot and a lot and a lot of what I call overhead VMs to deliver the actual workload VM that needs to run the applications. So in a cluster of five posts, you're gonna have a master image you're gonna have a CP template, you're gonna have a CP replica, and then you're gonna have parent VMs on every host, on every data center. This customer was a hyper-converged infrastructure customer, so they were using vSAN, so then this meant they had one data source for each cluster. However, in a cluster of 15, which is what we were sized for, um, that means that you're gonna have 18 VMs that are overhead to deliver the RDSH VMs that are actually the workload VMs. Okay, does that mean there's different images? I'm trying to understand, this instant clone, copies an image to the host and then replicates in memory, right? So you're saying it's copying the it's disk copying, of each? It's copying from the master image snapshot to the template, to the replica, and then across to each of the CP parents that go on each host and each data, uh, data source. Right. So we can talk about, um, take a little deep dive on the imaging technology, but the short version is if you have 15 hosts in a cluster, you have multiple clusters, this is a lot of overhead VMs. And they can get a little wild. So get wild CP, um, would love to have a PowerShell script that does, does this, but there's actually a utility that will show you all of your internal VMs that are not associated with any pools, because over time, things can get orphaned. Um, CP parents can be disconnected from the master image in the pool that they're associated with, and it can get pretty expensive. In this case, there was over 300 orphans in one cluster. This is really bad. So there's a lookup utility, it's really sweet. There's also a maintenance process where you can put the host in the maintenance, you can clean up the unprotected, you can unprotect and clean up some of the orphan the objects. UDB check not actually clear this up as well. <laughs> Which one? The UDB check. Um, it catches some of the orphans, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, the usage pro profile. I'm gonna go really quick because I'm actually done. If anybody has to leave, go ahead and leave. We've got 15 minutes until the next session. At the end, there were 80 RDS pools, uh, 20 BDI pools, 200 global entitlements, lots and lots and lots of infrastructure, lots of concurrent logins. Um, they're growing, continuing to grow. So things to do, um, figure out what your end goal is, design for that end goal, uh, do your best to work towards that, you know, start with why and then design towards that why. Um, I, these slides are gonna be available afterwards, so you'll be able to, to take a look at where things were broken up. This is basically a more modern design that uh, we're moving toward, the, in the process of moving towards, which has five pod architecture as you can broken out for each of the larger buckets of consumption. Epic being one of them, um, BDI from thin clients being another one. Um, so this is a way to logically break this up. Um, you also want to consider the um, connection servers that are going to be utilized for things like uh, VROPs for Horizon agents, um, Workspace ONE only brokers, and Horizon Access, uh, Horizon Admin Access points. Um, these sh should not be load balanced behind the same BIP as the other connection servers. 
should be dedicated just for that function so that you're keeping that load off of the other connection servers. 64 page design document is eventually what we got to that spells out all this stuff in detail. Um, I'm gonna skip through this. Uh, if you've used Workspace ONE, you know a little bit about Workspace ONE only mode. Um, there are some additional challenges which are kind of enumerated and highlighted here. Um, if you've run into any of these uh, particular scenarios, um, you're, you're not alone. Um, and there's things not to do. If you run into challenges with your deployment, don't stick your head in the sand and just ignore it. Do something, do something. Be proactive, uh, get engaged, um, get the resources that you need. There's extended benefits, particularly if you're in healthcare, there's this thing called healthcare critical support. I highly advise uh, enlisting into this option. Uh, most of you, if you have Verizon deployments already in it, um, get a TAM. Uh, get to know your TAM really well. Make sure your TAM is staying on top of your tickets and things that you need to advance your deployment. Um, customer Success is an amazing program that you have to beg, plead, borrow, and steal to get into. But once you're in it, it's an amazing option for getting more advanced access to VMware resources. Stay active and engaged with your account team. Um, do PSO engagements for risk mitigation. If you feel like I've got a handle, I know how to design this stuff, I know how to deploy this stuff, we're just going to go. Uh, mitigate your risk. Um, get a PSO engagement, make sure that it's blessed, make sure that everybody agrees this is a certified design that will work for our requirements, and then you move forward, because the last thing you want to do is be calling the vendors and having these support requests where they don't have a lot of context on the so your environment. Is that one um, hiring VMware to bless your design, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Um, look into third-party partner services such as NVIDIA's new, this is only launched in the last six months, um, they have a TAM service. Uh, it's definitely something that I would advise as well as having other vendor TAM services or consultants, uh, consultants and consulting services. Um, there's a lot of helpful resources. Um, most of these are available on the Fling site. Um, so there's a help desk utility, awesome. You're going to need this if, you're, if you want good visibility into your environment. Our tab, has a test application that you can see is my peripheral in a web and audio connection working properly. Um, the uh, VMware Reach or Horizon Reach product was just uh, launched as a fling. Um, a good friend of mine uh, designed and, and launched this um, into the market. That's an amazing tool. Um, Andrew gave us access to that. I was one of the beta testers and we've been running it for a while and it's, it's great. Yep. And Andrew's an amazing guy and he works really, really hard to uh, create good quality products. Um, so good stuff here. Uh, there's also the optimization tool. If you haven't used it, go grab it, go use it. Um, don't not optimize your environment. You're gonna benefit from it. Um, I have a couple resources out here on my GitHub repository. Um, I'm a PowerSheller guy. I can't say that my code is perfect, but I try. Um, I, I wrote a tool that will do an inventory of all of your hosting, your cluster, all of your hosting, your vCenter, and then tell you what version of the VIB software for uh, NVIDIA is installed on it. So if you're an NVIDIA customer, this is a must have because NVIDIA doesn't actually have a centralized management product to see what versions. And in, in some cases, you might actually be troubleshooting nuances where there's code differences between the host driver and you might need to know, oh my God, the infrastructure team that deployed all this kit didn't use the same VIB and now we have mismatch between the, the hosts even in the same cluster or different clusters, and that can cause you to have way too much time wasted in troubleshooting nuances between things that should be standardized. Um, I also wrote another one uh, that was a little bit painful, but we ran into a situation where a connection server would become uh, overloaded, and the web service, uh, the actual Tomcat service for the connection server would be up, but the service wouldn't be responding. Um, so if you go try and hit connection server slash admin or connection server, it's not there, but the service is still running. And good monitoring tools will catch this because you can do synthetic web application traces and see where it's failing. But um, especially if you're uh, not quite fully deployed with your monitoring solution, having something that will scan every connection server on a regular frequency and say, is the web service up, is the web service up, is it up? Because if that goes down, it will cause impact in your environment. Um, F5 monitors are insufficient to address some of the issues 
that can arise if your connection server is down, if it's down for an extended period of time, if it gets out of sync, if you have replication the, issues. The F5 can't do an app level check? It does, but it's insufficient because um, typically that's going to go to a different group. The load balancing oh, team I might see, see that it's down, yeah. might not trigger to the EUC team, hey, okay. you actually have a connection server that's not in a good state, and it will eventually cause outages with the users if it's left in that state for too long. Um, and I've got a couple examples of, of when that's occurred. Um, so there's a script out there. I also use the same logic to actually check the web service and see if the web service is up to do a staggered restart of the connection server in a local pod. Is you do on, on occasion need to reboot these guys and you don't want to take all of them down in a little pod and bring all of them up and things about you know data center power management be mindful if you bring all of your connection servers up simultaneously you will create issues in your environment so don't do that stagger the starts stagger the reboots make sure that connection servers come up are healthy and then introduce the other ones otherwise replication is going to get off and it's not going to be a fun time um, Last plug, and then uh, I had filler slides because I wasn't sure if the UDP method of fire and forget would actually get through all these sessions uh, or all these topics. So I do have some extra slides for special topics. But if this event was useful to you, if this was meaningful, if you like this more community-oriented, friends and family, Switzerland type approach to learn about all the different technologies in the end user computing space, Steve's in the room. He throws an amazing retreat called the EUC Masters Retreats in Scottsdale, beautiful area. Um, go register because if you like getting to know people in the community and picking their brains about specific topics, this is a great forum to do that. Thanks, Dane. Um, and if you're in this room and you're still in this room, you would like it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if, you, if you hung in here till the end, you would like it. Um, it's really filling a gap that, you know, if you've been doing EUC for a while, you know that there's a, a, a particular gap in America's without having bright form. Um, for us EUC geeks, we love the community, we love picking other people's brains, figuring out best practices and tips and tricks and all that kind of stuff. EUC Masters Retreat is the forum for doing that. So, um, don't need to go there. Uh, lots, of, uh, lots of things. Hopefully the things to do and the things not to do is useful for you. If you want to dive into more details on how these things manifested themselves and the issues that were um, overcome, um, I'm certainly happy to talk about them. Um, and that's about it. Um, that's a little bit about me. That's uh, one of the two large enterprise projects that I've been focused on in the last year. And you can learn more. So thank you all. Thank you.